Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Roberta Yanacito Provenzano, and I am the Provost and Vice President Academic at Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm pleased to welcome you to our Democracy Forum hosted by the Dais. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the history of the land we are on. This acknowledgement is a place to begin our thinking about truth and reconciliation. And I encourage everyone to consider their relationship to the land and, indig and indigenous peoples. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Thank you everyone for being here. As many of you know, the Democracy Forum is a nonpartisan platform for politicians and practitioners to engage in dialogue and increase democratic engagement. I'm looking forward to hearing from our special guest today, they will be formally introduced shortly. Today's discussion is a great fit for our university because our campus is proud to host the TMU Center for Immigration and Settlement and also the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration. As an institution, TMU believes in fostering dialogue and debate as our teaching, learning, and research are driven by the diversity of ideas and experiences of our community. Our moderator today is M Martin Reg Khan, a political columnist at the Toronto Star covering Queen's Park. Founder of the Democracy Forum at TMU, Martin is a senior fellow at the Dais on campus and a senior fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. He was a foreign correspondent for 11 years in Asia and the Middle East and was also a parliamentary correspondent. I'm delighted to be here with all of you today and I'm sure there will be a lively and interesting discussion. And without uh, further ado, I'll uh, hand it over to Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you, bienvenue, bonjour, welcome to our 32nd Democracy Forum at TMU, where we try to do democracy differently and democratically. If you're watching live on the star.com or on TV via the CPAC television network, thanks for joining us. Uh, a year ago this month, our guest at the Democracy Forum was Canada's Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, who was very much in the headlines. Today, 12 months later, our guest is once again the Minister of Immigration and Refugees, but there's a new minister making new headlines. Last year, the title of our Democracy Forum was Canada's Juggling Act, and this year our title is Canada's Rebalancing Act, which is perhaps appropriate given the news of the last few days. So before we begin, I always remind people that this is not a news conference or a confrontation. It's a democracy forum where we try to dig a little deeper. More importantly, we try to get more in-depth answers from our guests. So it's not that we throw softballs, but we're trying to put more pressure on our guests to go beyond talking points or press conference scripts and give more thoughtful and reflective answers. So no pressure, but let me tell you about our guest today. Mark Miller has been Canada's Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship since mid-2023. He was previously Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations and also Minister of Indigenous Services. You could say he has been the Prime Minister's chosen fixer for some of the most challenging issues in government. He was elected as MP for the Montreal riding of Ville-Marie, Le Sud-Ouest, Ile des Sœurs in 2015. And in 2017, he delivered the first ever speech in the Mohawk language in the House of Commons. Before politics, he had a life. He served as an infantry soldier in the Canadian Armed Forces Reserves, and he later practiced international and commercial law in New York and Sweden. He has a BA and MA from the Université de Montréal and law degrees from McGill University. Minister, welcome to TMU. Bienvenue chez nous. Hello. Good to have you. Now, there's a lot of interest on campus about your appearance today, as the provost pointed out. 
because TMU is home to the Center for Immigration and Resettlement Studies, and TMU also hosts the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration. And that position is held by my co-host today, Professor Anna Tranda Filidu. Now, before coming to TMU in 2019, she taught at the European University Institute, where she also earned her PhD. She's a sociologist and migration policy expert and now leads TMU's new multi-million dollar research program, Bridging Divides, awarded to a consortium of four universities led by TMU. Anna, welcome back to the Democracy Forum. Hello. Hi, Anna. Both Anna and I want to thank also our audience for the hundreds of questions that we have received that were submitted in advance. We'll be borrowing from those questions and integrating them into our own questions. If you're watching on Zoom, you can use the chat function online if you think of more questions. Okay, I'm going to kick things off. Uh, this is a democracy foreign minister, so I'd like to talk about the politics of immigration, but first, the economics of immigration and refugees. You got a lot of attention yesterday for a news conference where you said something that I don't recall any previous minister of immigration and refugees saying, which is that you were going to dial down the numbers, not in recent memory anyway. Um, we have 2.5 million temporary residents. That's 6.2% of the population, as you pointed out. It also grew faster than in almost any other country in the Western world. Yesterday, you said that that should come down to 5% in the next few years. That's a lot of people. So my question, just to get you started, is how did we get there? And when did you realize, as the new minister, when you took over, that we needed a significant course correction or almost a change in direction? Well, th thank you, Martin, for this. Uh, it, it, it's an important question. E economic issues, uh, social fabric issues have been uh, the core of my focus ever since the prime minister asked me to serve as, well, as a minister, obviously, in, in my previous role, but uh, particularly so in, uh, in, in, in June when, um, when he asked me to serve as minister of immigration. Um, it's been clear that over the last number of years, there has been a jump from, uh, you know, 2% of the population to 6.2% of the population in, in what we call temporary residence. That's a very interesting pie chart to break down. It isn't what people usually think of normally, which is temporary foreign workers uh, in the agricultural field and the fish processing field, which is a very small percentage of that. It's, it's people on postgraduate permits, uh, like people that come out of TMU that are international students, international students themselves. Uh, those that are fleeing humanitarian crises, particularly like Ukraine, of which we have about 300 or will have about 300,000 people here that we didn't have a couple of years ago. Uh, and then other other sort of smaller parts of the pie chart, including arrangements under our international agreements, uh, intercompany transfers, uh, you know, the nature of an, uh, an interwoven economy with, um, with, with other countries. Uh, but no doubt in the last few years, that has really jumped. And we've seen the impact on something economists, Bank of Canada calls the, the cost of shelter, or people refer to it more commonly as housing. Um, it's undeniable that that volume has caused an impact on 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 affordability generally, particularly on the cost of shelter, and and that is something I think we owe it to Canadians, owe it to ourselves to take a look at, and to the extent that this portion is a is a is a correlative or even causative factor, we need to we need to address that. And I can't do it alone as the federal government. We aren't alone solely responsible for the labor market. It is also the responsibility and duty of the provinces, and so sending that signal is very important both for the economy but also for provinces to say to themselves hey let's get uh, let's get to the table and talk about what our labor needs are uh, because these adjustments uh, can't be rough they have to be surgically done and they have to target areas where we feel we can bring things down reasonably without causing uh, price inflation food inflation and all sorts of other perverse effects that can come with you know radical changes so those are my thoughts behind it and i'm uh, glad to take more questions so, so, so you've set the table for us, and 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 there's a lot to unpack there. And I know Anna wants to jump in in a couple of minutes to to look more closely at the student uh, visa component of that. Uh, you mentioned the 300,000 Ukrainians. That's a new number, I think, and and we would be good to look at that in a couple of minutes as well. But but let's talk also about about how we got here and why it took so long to do the course correction. Again, you're the new minister. I know you're not going to throw your colleagues under the bus. It's not what you do. But these are these are really big numbers and that have come up very fast. And, and I'm wondering, you know, you said this week that uh, or you said in the past that that we become addicted to temporary foreign workers. And you've said that that business has an incentive to drive down 
labor costs. And you talked about that a little bit yesterday. So, so I think you mentioned in your speech yesterday, in your opening remarks, that, that there are that, that there are economic pitfalls of over-reliance on temporary workers. What did you mean by that? In your own mind, what are those economic pitfalls? What is that addiction? What is that low-wage issue that you're mindful of? Well, I guess a couple things. Uh, you know, first in terms of the responsibility of of the federal government. Clearly, we even going into COVID, we had labor shortages across the country, broad, um, less sector specific than they are now. Uh, that was much the case as well coming out of COVID. So, if you look at the public policy decisions that we take, we took. I, I don't fault my own government for having having taken those decisions. Um, in addition to the important public policy decisions we took. Uh, in terms of the crises that have unfolded around the world that were entirely unpredictable and that we, uh, as a haven for those seeking refuge, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Syria, uh, have opened up our hearts to a whole range of people that are now considered as an economic a statistical measure, which is much more, they're much more than that, you'll, you'll concede, but they are, they are tallied into that number of people that are now here on a temporary basis that will transition eventually into permanent residence for a large chunk or go back to Ukraine in the case of, of Ukraine. So. Um, but those I, were that those were events. Just to jump in quickly, just to clarify my own question, those are events that that you that we've responded to. I'm thinking more about what you what your own thoughts are, which you which you refer to publicly about the pressure from business to have a low wage source of workers that that became an addiction. And so, what are the pitfalls that you're worried about? Yeah, and and sort of my only point in all that, Martin, was to say that public policy decisions have consequences that sometimes we don't fully think through. And I think that is something that we need to take responsibility for. Uh, in the case of your question, uh, you know, clearly we know the, the need in businesses to make to increase margins. Uh, and sometimes that is done in, I wouldn't overstate it because there is a low wage stream to some of the temporary foreign workers that are here, but some of them are highly specialized and re respond to market needs. Whether that's exaggerated or not is something we have to look at and examine with uh, with our own labor departments, with economists, with our provincial counterparts. Uh, but that motive and imperative exists. I mean, we certainly have heard, for example, in one of the measures that my colleague Randy Boissonneau announced reducing some of the areas where people were allowed to take in three temporary foreign workers to 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 to, to ten non uh, that was a COVID measure to to fill a gap in for example the the hospitality industry food industry that need is no longer there by our estimation and it is something that um, that was continued throughout COVID and that needs to come to an end uh, so those are sort of adjustments that may be difficult and we'll certainly hear from from industry players uh, the impact that that will have the margins and perhaps the closures of uh, of 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 some uh, some chains threatened, uh, but we do think that there is a domestic labor pool available that that can that can be drawn on, whether it's asylum seekers, whether it's students with post work graduate permits, that doesn't need to be sourced from abroad and doesn't have to carry on corresponding effect on um, the impact on the cost of housing in the aggregate or the cost of shelter in the aggregate and the corresponding pressures of more people in the country on the education system or the healthcare system, which are obviously elements that are. But before, but before, before I hand it off, Anna, I just want to fo focus it on on what if you didn't do this course correction? What would be happening if you didn't make this change? What would be those pitfalls? Well, what, where where would that addiction takes us take us? I think it takes us to a space where the, our planning in terms of our social infrastructure, our infrastructure generally, whether it's housing, um, education, healthcare, are increasingly stressed by the unlimited number of arrivals in Canada that increase the population of people here physically present and drive up that uh, the cost of shelter. That's uh, that's undeniable. There are many other factors such as interest rates that are driving those up. That is not the fault of, uh, of immigrants or temporary residents. But in terms of that contributive factor, it's something I think we need to show as a responsible government that we, are, we have a handle on it. And I think signaling that to the market is something that is very important, but also making that and affecting that change in the right way is even more important because what you can do in a, in a, in, in a recession is even drive that further if you if if you overcorrect. Are you are you worried though from what you hear from economists because you say you were consulting economists that our business sector would become over reliant on this stream of low wage workers? Well, I'd say not all economists are on the same page. You have varying reports coming out of various granularity, and you'll see some of them change their mind a year later, and that you know is natural. We do that as well, um, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be scrutinizing what's coming out and analyzing them with our own data. And I think that is always 
that's always key. Uh, obviously, they don't bear the responsibility of that decision politically. At the end of the day, we do. Um, yeah. But we owe it to ourselves to be able to have something that is much, much more reliable so that we can use it to coordinate in terms of our policy that we take with areas that are outside our jurisdiction. That means making sure provinces are responsible for their actions and planning and planning going forward. Okay, Anna, over to you. There, there are two pieces to this puzzle, workers, students. I think Anna has some questions on this. Well, thank you. First of all, I would like to say I came in this country as a temporary work permit holder in 2019. So I feel personally connected to the issue. And I've, I've learned be, beyond being an immigration policy expert, I've learned the ropes by doing it myself uh, for what is worth it. But I wanted um, yeah, to go back to the measures you took in December 2023 in relation to international students. I have to say um, a little bit like with the workers, with international students, there has been this up and down related to COVID. So it is true, our numbers were going up before the pandemic. Then with the pandemic, we faced a crisis. Then there was this idea of we need to, to, to keep attracting the best and brightest as international students. But then it seems the system got a little bit overheated. So there are a few questions there. First of all, to what extent it was the fault of the provinces, particularly Ontario, or it was the fault of the colleges and universities in your view. A second question is, I felt personally as, as an expert that the, the measures you took in December were the right measures. And I was so happy you didn't impose the cap. And then less than three months later, you imposed the cap, which as we know is a bit of a stop gap measure, but it can have a lot of negative side effects. So I'd like to have um, your reflection on, on this, what led you to First, do the more structural measures, then impose the cap. And what are you doing now to make those more important measures become reality? Yeah, and it, it's a really good set of questions, Anna. I, I, the measures that we took initially were to address uh, what Martin was talking about, which is the federal responsibility for, for, these, uh, for these matters, which is making sure that we had integrity and in actual visa issue verification process. The increase in the solvency requirements for students up, up to at least our international competitor standards uh, and the rolling out of a recognized institution models, which is still ongoing and will be a very important part of the conversation going forward to answer the last part of your question. To make sure that we are rewarding, separating the wheat from the chaff, making rewarding those institutions that have the ability to welcome and, and attract the top talent for which the international visa student program was designed for in the first place to use a, a particularly poignant example of that. Um, what became also obvious as we were looking at the numbers, uh, again, to Martin's earlier points, is that uh, uncapped, we were seeing potential increases of the student numbers from one plus million to 1.4 million next year, which really, uh, and in areas where we had also seen a surge of the cost of shelter. Uh, that is the result of we can talk about the, the under, you know, the underfunding, the systemic underfunding, particularly in Ontario, of post-secondary education. In, intelligent institutions have have adapted accordingly and gone to look for a source of revenue, uh, three times, four times more than what they can charge uh, statutorily to a domestic applicant or, or a Canadian, and so they've they've adjusted accordingly. Don't necessarily fault them entirely for that, but I think that has to be done responsibly. Uh, it, had we not capped this, we would have seen exponential growth over the next one or two years with uh, some very important, very, very negative carry on effects uh, in a number of areas. One, obviously, um, price inflation, but also in the number of people seeking asylum. Uh, it's, it's not a very well known statistic, but it happens to be accurate that in the Ontario educational post secondary educational system, there were there were 10,000 asylum seekers over the last three years alone. We were in the process of creating our own home generated asylum crisis, um, largely within the responsibility of the provinces, but it didn't mean the federal government doesn't have some role to play. So my reflection as it evolved over the last few months was that we needed to create a space and an incentive after a number of warnings for provinces to act, to take responsibility over their education system. There are many auditor general reports that have pointed that out, not, not only to Ontario, we shouldn't single out a province, but that's the reality. But in British Columbia and other provinces that were on that sort of exponential uh, trajectory. Um, that's going to come with some turbulence, as you mentioned. And the measures that I took uh, were not necessarily surgical ones, they were blunt. But those are the policy instruments that I have constitutionally to affect that change. As we move forward with recognized institutions, as we have proposed in the fall, 
there's an ability for the government to step in if um, if provinces don't assume that jurisdiction and, and clean up some of the mess in their own kitchen. I have had lots of assurances from provinces that they are on board now that we've announced the cap, um, but it isn't perfect. This is something that has gone uncapped for many decades without the need to do so. So that ramp up is has been quite has been exponential in the last few years, um, and it's something I think we need to, to get a rein on. It, it, tying it into the conversation that we opened up this um, this discussion on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, yeah, we, we understand the need to control what's going to happen in fall 2024, though we are very concerned that what's going to happen in fall 2024 um, is a big confusion. And for instance, universities like Toronto Metropolitan University that have been among the virtuous ones that have about 10% international students, not 35, will find themselves in, you know, to, to pay the price for other universities and colleges, a bit of reckless behavior. But beyond that, I wanted to ask you something else which relates to housing that has been already very much a big part of the conversation. Now, um, we've been talking in true mathematics is not a matter of opinion. So there's more people in the country, there's a finite number of accommodation, housing of different sorts, and there's higher pressure. But I want to raise another question. I don't have numbers to back it up, but I have a lot of, how can I say, anecdotal evidence that international students are renting those basements and those bedrooms that allow middle class families and lower middle class families to pay their mortgages. Um, so what will happen with that? We expect important issues, both the uncertainty for the universities and colleges for September 2024, but um, some shortages in the labor market, but also possibly such a secondary, you know, un unexpected effect. You, you spoke earlier about unexpected effects um, that these international students won't be there. People won't be able to pay their mortgages. I mean, look, we didn't bring international students in this country to pay for people's mortgages. I know, I know you would agree with, with me on that. Um, at the same time, it, we know that when students are in a particular area of town, I, I think of you know the, the McGill student area. There are um, microinflationary pressures that occur in um, in those areas where students live, and so there are a ton of challenges associated with that on the other side of the equation. Again, this this, and I'm not unconcerned by that point, and I don't want to dismiss it. I think it's important not to dismiss it. Um, this change is not as radical a change as we could be, or we might take. Uh, simply because of the reflection of the increased numbers. It is ba it is based on a three-year period out of a, a no new net growth, uh, but it may be growth that we may need to um, to tailor further depending on what we see as the results or the impacts that the corresponding effects and actions that the provinces take in order to adjust for this. If they start to punish the good actors, uh, that's an unfortunate consequence that um, you know, I may have to have a say over, but obviously we have to give the chance to the provinces to exercise the jurisdictions that they have not necessarily been doing uh, properly in the past on this particular area. And, and I think that's a space that we need to afford them the ability to do. Uh, my bigger concern is on housing generally and the availability of spaces. Um, the increase of affordability and mortgages in particular, uh, I certainly don't want to put on the, on the backs of international students but it is the reality that everyone is living with and, and, and is something I think at times gets gets conflated with the more the more particular problem at hand, which is one that was one fundamentally of the integrity of the system. So I guess to answer your 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 point more directly, this change I don't think is drastic enough over the time period that we are looking at uh, to create sort of situations where people would not be able to pay their mortgage because they can't rely on the student. But again, this is this is one of the consequences of having that lack of housing um, tailored to students, uh, a high mortgage interest rate, and 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 challenges that we face. Uh, and it, and it shouldn't um, it shouldn't be on an international visa system to correct all those issues. And I'm sure you'll agree with me as an expert. No, I agree. I agree with you. It's just though talking about the unexpected effects, but I think. We're getting there to the politics of it, and I'll pass the baton to Martin. Thanks, Anna, and thank you, Anna, for uh, for indulging in anecdotal uh, evidence. Uh, as a professor and expert, it makes me feel good as a journalist because professors are always pretending to be more scientific and rigorous than us humble journalists. Uh, uh, Minister, you talked about having a uh, maybe having to tailor things further, and even perhaps a radical maneuver. Tell us what that might be. 
Well, you know, I wouldn't say it depends on behavior. And so decisions are made based on behavior that I haven't seen take place yet, notably the reaction of the provinces. We're sort of in an interim period where we are waiting for provinces to get out letters of verification for the March period uh, that we've asked them to do. The system is currently frozen. The, this year will be one when it comes to international students where there will be turbulence. It'll be hard to analyze uh, or draw you know, clear conclusions this year because there's still some some adjustments to, to watch for. But clearly, as I was analyzing the data, we saw that in some areas there has been large inflation in the K-12 to part of this, which is uncapped, particularly in the secondary uh, the secondary school system in some in some provinces, British Columbia in particular, um, and the tendency in the master's and PhD programs uh, to game the system. There are um, you know there are fake business degrees, but there are also people looking to expand into sort of kind of fake MBAs uh, and try to attract more people for 50 grand ahead uh, and not come out with a particularly good education. So that's something that I'm keenly aware of. And, uh, you know, I am, I, I don't want to see people game the system on this because we do have to control. There's a quality and a quantity proposition and we have to be able to, to regulate both. You've talked about uh, puppy mills and um, I, I hadn't heard the phrase until you mentioned it. I wonder if puppy mills comes from diploma mills and you kind of conflated the two, but you were pretty upset about that. I know you like to be a happy, you and the prime minister go way back. You like to be happy warriors, but you've been pretty unhappy, an unhappy warrior uh, on this issue file, as you might say, for the last few weeks and months. So so let's look at the fallout that Anna's been talking about and, and, and the behavior that you talk about. So how did we get there? You, you, you can't but be seized of the way in which the universities and colleges and their puppy mill partners have been squeezed into it's been a squeeze play in Ontario mostly, but in other provinces where they were incentivized to get foreign revenues uh, disproportionately from foreign uh, from for, revenues from foreign students who were charged a, a much higher quantum. So, um, you talked about an unhealthy reliance of of business on low wage workers. Was there an unhealthy reliance by Ontario colleges and universities on high fee foreign students? Yeah, I know we, we've talked a lot of Martin about sort of sham institutions that exist. Uh, there's multiple example, examples of them in and around Brampton, Mississauga and Surrey. Surrey has half of the designated learning institutions in British Columbia. They exist. Um, people have seen the documentaries over and, and some of the excesses that we've seen at, uh, at CBU. But Kitchener Waterloo but, here, but, uh, Susan Marie, are they on your radar? I'm, I'm, I've actually met with, uh, with with the Sioux and said, you know, and, and, and the number of, of institutions that they, um, I don't want to talk about sham. I want to talk about people that have just been able to leverage a system and an ecosystem that has incentivized them to, to get people that are paying four or five times the price that they would pay, uh, that my kids are currently paying, at least two of them at, um, at universities in Canada. Uh, so it, there is that the sham part of it, but there's also sort of the unhealthy ecosystem and incentive that, is, that, is, that has been created even at some of the top institutions in Canada. Uh, and those aren't the ones that I'm particularly concerned about. I can only level the policy uh, measures that I have at the ones that are, I think, ones we need to focus a little more on as a society. But we have to acknowledge at the same time there has been an ecosystem that's been created with an over-reliance on, on, on international students uh, just, just for people to... To complete their balance sheets or to balance the balance sheets, so the the there are other institutions that have um, each. There is at least one institution in Ontario that uh, had a positive hundred million dollar positive balance at the end of the year, and that, that in my mind isn't the vocation of um, of, a, of a college or university. Not that I would deny any one uh, the right to get profit, but you know you're doing it on a bunch of people that. That are have sometimes had their family earnings pooled into one person, their hopes of dreams into one person, drawn to Canada on the on the basis of that dream that I believe still exists, and have it dashed quickly when they can't get a job or get a crappy education, uh, and then have to file for for asylum in some of the worst case scenarios. And that isn't an uncommon occurrence. I would also say, on the recruitment end, uh, institutions have been pretty lazy in, in going out and recruiting people. We're supposed to have an international system that targets the best and the brightest. Um, you can't convince me that that comes 45% from only one source country uh, as, as much as it's a country that I like. But, it, you know, it, it, it's something that I think we need to reckon and our, and our people recruiting folks abroad need to take a broader look at their recruitment practices and who they rely on abroad. 
Yeah, that's, a, that's an important point because there's no question there are a couple of clusters that have evolved over the last couple of decades that are much different from when you and I went to school. Um, so it sounds like we had two addictions, addiction to foreign workers, addiction to foreign students. And we and, and governments, provincial and federal, were almost the pushers in all of this. Well, these are all multi-billion dollar propositions and pushes. Look, we, uh, the, the approach I have for the federal government is we, we trusted and we didn't verify enough. Um, this is largely something that is a provincial jurisdiction. Uh, you know, we're, we are the only ones that don't take points on the package on this one. This is something that is where the province gets $1,000 per international student and the institutions sometimes get 30, 40,000. So with money comes responsibility. Um, it doesn't mean the federal government doesn't either. We issue those visas, so that's on us. And that's why the measures that we're taking, we think make sense and always ready to do more if it, if it doesn't work. But that adjustment I think needs to happen. And that's why this year, I think sadly, because there will be uh, some effects that are unanticipated, undesired, this is a year that will have some turbulence. Yeah, as you may know, colleges uh, show up on the provincial government's balance sheets, uh, universities don't. So those positive balances are very helpful to our finance minister. Uh, just quickly, before I hand it over to, to Anna, you talked a lot about communications on this issue. And yesterday you talked about communications. They'll have a federal provincial meeting in, in May. What about Ontario and Ottawa? I mean, on, on the one hand, the prime minister and the deputy prime minister and the premier of Ontario have had a, a lot of communications. But then it came out that the Ontario Minister of uh, Colleges and Universities and Training said that she had been caught unawares by this, blindsided by this. And I don't think you, suddenly you weren't a very happy warrior for the day in both official languages. You called it garbage, I think. What happened there? Was there a breakdown in communications or was there a distortion of those communications? Yeah, and I, you know, you, you've said the Prime Minister and I share the same happy warrior. I'm a little grumpier than the Prime Minister. And, and, and good, I think good. that's a government. Like that. Of, of public record, but um, it, it simply isn't accurate that we there have been a number of outreach initiatives with uh, with Minister Dunlop, um, as well as with Minister Puccini. Uh, there were a number of warnings that were issued quite publicly, uh, publicly by me, but also through our public privately through our officials. So um, you know the measure that we took and the timing of it, so people didn't game the system, uh, was one that needed to be done at the outset of the cabinet retreat. But it was something that people knew was coming and was at least threatened. So uh, that is what it is. It's not that we had I hadn't spoken to Minister Dunlop, uh, and I have since. I think they have shown at least public good faith. We're waiting to see the results on that, and we have to give them that opportunity. Frankly, I I, I wait I wait the results, but I, I I do have some hope. It is the bigger volume proposition in all of Canada, so it is very significant to see what Ontario will do. Did, do you think that she and the Minister of Labour thought you were bluffing? I don't know. I do think that there is a <laughs> there is a tendency from our provincial count counterparts that we're the nice, soft federal government. And if you push us enough, we'll bend and um, everything's great. But uh, some, when sometimes things aren't, we need to take decisions and be hard nosed and hard headed about it. OK, I just want to follow up briefly on what Anna was trying to put press you on and just ask again about and you talked, you 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 elaborated on the on the foreign recruitment side of things. Aren't you worried though? I, I recognize, and you said that there are jurisdictional challenges you have to be mindful of. But aren't you worried about the fallout internationally for the reputation of universities like TMU, U of T, others? That that there is now this enormous amount of uncertainty that has been thrown into the equation. That hurts. Um. Yeah, uncertainty in any business proposition hurts, uh, and that and that is undeniable. I think that the reality is well, what I've heard from a number of uh, of institutions in Canada, a number of concerned people that are concerned about the imposition of this cap, is this will hurt Canada's stellar international reputation. I would put to you that, despite the fact that Canada is seen as one of the best places to study and work in the world, perhaps even number one, um, the reputation is that. If you get a student visa, this is a backdoor entry into Canada, and that's a very negative uh, reputation, particularly for those who fought so hard to be here. Um, and that's seen, and it's felt in uh, in 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 the, in the same source diasporas that um, a number of these students are coming from. So it not only hurts the students, it hurts the institutions in the long run, despite the short term gain with. Uh, the multi-billion dollar proposition that international students are, um, but it is the long-term deterioration of an education system that shouldn't rely on international students uh, for uh, for its for its funds. So that is an unhealthy 
reliance. Um, I think these measures will shore up Canada's reputation. And frankly, when I talk to my partner countries, whether it's Australia, UK, or, or America, they, uh, they you know, particularly Australia has been quite public, but in the UK as well, uh, there is real concern on their end about the same thing happening to them. And they have taken measures that are a little different from ours, but they've recognized that this is a challenge and seen as a, as a backdoor entry into Canada. Okay. Anna, over to you. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say something, and it's not an example that comes from, from research, that we, what we find is, however, the narrative about Canada is not, okay, uh, we, we shouldn't denigrate ourselves. The narrative is very positive. People say, I want to go there, study, and, and live there. It's a safe place. It's a place where I can thrive myself, my community. I can practice my religion, my traditions. Um, and, and of course, there's a future in terms of economic well-being. There's a future for my kids. So I think we shouldn't denigrate ourselves too, too much. I, I, I agree. And I, I agree also with Martin that there is a need for a communication campaign there that should accompany those measures precisely to say this is an adjustment um, of the course. It's not a change in, in the whole narrative. But uh, going back to, to the narrative, I want to turn to a completely different issue. Minister, I mean, it was it was great to read the numbers um, this morning that you announced because even us researchers had been struggling in knowing the exact um, distribution of our temporary, uh, you know, permit holders. Um, I read, I've been proud as a new Canadian for all the small programs that Canada has which aim to bring loved ones, extended families who are in crisis situations like Sudan, like Beirut three years ago, um, like Gaza at this moment, to bring them here. People who have family, people who are siblings, grandparents, parents, uh, to the best of my knowledge, no other country does this in the world. At the same time, there is a stark contrast. You, you mentioned this I mean, in the announcement this morning, there's 300,000 Ukrainians. Um, and we know there's 1 million permits approved through the special program. And these other programs that I'm talking about are programs that bring in 1,000 people, 2,000 people. They are often uncapped, but we know that's the target. So can you justify, I mean, we're, I mean we, we as researchers, and I speak not just for myself, of course, we're in favor to, prote to provide international protection to whoever needs it. The, the question is not not to provide the protection to Ukrainian. But we do see a stark contrast between different people needing protection. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, thanks, Anna. A really excellent point. And, and just to your earlier point, and I know you deviated to this one, which is which, which perhaps, perhaps more important, but we are the number one country in freedom of expression, freedom of religion, uh, one of the top healthcare systems. So very, still very attractive. I see that in the volumes of people that want to come to Canada, and indeed it's caused pressure on on our system. So I don't want to create say that there's no good, but there's bad reputation, but the reputation of this international visa program is one that is subject to exploitation. And that's just the reality and the word of mouth that gets passed around. So um, fixing that is, is important. Uh, when it comes to our humanitarian pathways, I, you know, it, it did strike me when I was in Geneva in December, talking to my counterparts, how Canada is still a standout when it comes to uh, how we are seen as a beacon of hope for the international community. It also struck me that a lot of the work that we are doing is something that we can't do alone. Um, we are sort of alone out there on that particular uh, Gaza program, which is limited compared to the one that we deployed with respect to the Ukraine for a number of geopolitical reasons that I think we is, are important to get into, although I don't like comparing the programs too much. Um, They've invited comparison publicly, so I can't uh, I can't avoid it. Uh, the, the Ukraine resettlement program was one that, yes, is temporary. Uh, there was uh, there are very few paths to permanency um, in the face of an aggression from uh, from, from Russia, a nuclear superpower, coordinated with with a number of other countries uh, in a in, in a relatively short period of time, uh, unseen of I think in, in modern Canadian history. So it it, it is unique. Um, and it is one I think Canadians can be very proud of. Uh, it, it has contributed to the public policy reality that we face and the challenges that we face today. But no one would in Canada uh, that is in peddling some garbage rhetoric would propose to send them back or uh, propose to treat these folks differently until and, until the war is won by Ukraine. Um, and so that is something I think we we have to we have to be quite conscious of um, when it comes to. And that program was irrespective of whether anyone had a family anchor. When it comes to the 
the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza and the war in Hamas that's going on. Um, geopolitically, it is very different. Um, you will recall that uh, when previous foreign affairs ministers proposed resettlement for Palestinians, they were uh, widely decried as the emptying of, of Palestine. So there's a geopolitical reality that I think we have to reflect in, in where we put programs uh, and establish programs. At the same time, people are expecting just to keep their loved ones safe and are scrambling to get out through Rafa gates. Uh, we've had some difficulty in getting our own people out, Canadian citizens and permanent residents, what we call consular cases, through Rafa gates, which we do not control. They are controlled by COGAT, which is a wing of the Israeli Minister of Defense and the um, and, and, and Egyptian authorities. And so the program that we put together over the Christmas period in record time uh, was one that was intended to to gather uh, people that we knew had connections to Canada, but weren't permanent residents and Canadians and have them sponsored by their close ones here so they could just get to safety. Well, first to Cairo and then to Canada. Um, that is a program that has had very limited success. Uh, only 14 people have come out through their own efforts. Uh, and we are in the process of dealing with them now, but the lists that we have submitted sadly have not been accepted. Um, for a variety of policy reasons that I, I'm not going to get into because we have, I worry about those people, I want to get them out, and we still have to have ongoing negotiations with the authorities on the ground. Um, any sort of larger discussion about resettlement of Palestinians uh, around the globe is a completely different set of political discussions and ones I think that are very fraught on a number of levels, and I think you can you, you can guess what they are. And I think that that is the challenge that we face over and above the fact that Canada, in terms of this particular policy measure, is alone. There is, to my knowledge, no other country that is doing and offering this in this type of uh, in this type of scope. Um, but we have to do it because we have said to our to the people here that are looking to save their loved ones that we are going to do it. And I think we can't stop trying, but up to now it hasn't been the success that we expected it to be in, in the context of these dramatic conditions. You know, obviously juxtaposing Ukraine to Gaza and these conditions, with Ukraine, we didn't have to go through any intermediary. In, in Gaza, we, we obviously <clears throat> had the success. For we sure. Anna, can I jump in quickly? And I'll, get, I'll relinquish the baton. We'd like to throw it back and forth, the two of us. But on, on Gaza, um, so... I think we've what we're learning from you today uh, we're seeing is that this ministry is nothing if not complex the complexity is is just mind-boggling um i think you've called this program a failure the gaza program uh, because it hasn't produced the results that you wanted despite your best intentions and you've been as you suggest criticized for on the one hand potentially depopulating gaza on the other hand trying to have a humanitarian angle on this and being unable to deliver having put in a cap of a thousand i think you took off the cap of a thousand, but it's probably an academic question now. So how, how have you personally navigated uh, this particular challenge in Gaza? You talked even about how the resolution in the House of Commons this week might have made your job more difficult because the Israelis might be more intransigent on the security question. You've been criticized for asking too many, making too many demands on security questions for folks. On the other hand, so you're getting it from every which way. So how, how have you navigated this particular Gaza uh, political challenge? And human challenge. Well, it, it's not fun, Martin, um, trying to navigate between being called a, a, a terrorist on one end or, or a traitor on one end or a, a racist on the other. Um, I don't think there's any just middle in any of those debates. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of people that died. No one should worry, be worried uh, on the balance, given the situation about my feelings. But the reality is that this is a situation that is very heated. There are a lot of Canadians that are uh, faulting their own government, whether it's Canadian government's fault or not. Uh, if I was a Palestinian family trying to get my uh, my kids or grandparents or whatever out, I would understandably be pissed off with my my own government. I get that. Um, it hasn't prevented us from trying, and that is what we continue to do. Um, and I don't think Canadians would forgive us if we didn't try. But it is a very delicate situation uh, over which Canada has very little control. Uh, you know, the one 
noted geopolitical player in the arena uh, that can make a difference in this is the US. And it too has had very limited success. Um, so it, it doesn't mean we, we drop our arms and say we're not uh, going to help these people because they are in such dire circumstances. My team and I have personally invested a lot of time just getting individuals out one by one on in, in very dire circumstances for medical reasons. Um, so you can imagine trying to do that in a systemic way. It just is, uh, it, it, it is not possible. Given and this, and this, and this yeah. all the complexity, what's the biggest single obstacle? Is it is Israeli bureaucracy? Is it is, is Egyptian um, uh, inertia? What is, what is it that's causing so much problems? Um, well, look, I think there is, uh, this is a singularly unique program. I think there is, a, I think logistics, there's a number of problems. I wouldn't say it's just one. Um, our diplomatic efforts, I'm not going to speak to publicly, particularly because lives are at risk, um, but there are challenges. Um, and everything Canada does is watched carefully by uh, by our international partners. Okay. Anna, sorry. Yeah, we, uh, I and I know in our Q&A, there's a lot of questions and comments about Gaza, but I want to turn back to the general principle that Canada has had to have these programs to bring loved ones but also the, the fact that Canada, as you said, is a forerunner in terms of refugee resettlement. We have had the Afghans pro program that was supposed to be to bring 40,000. I think we have now more than 32,000 people in the country. Um, similarly, we've just started a new program for Venezuelans and Haitians. And still, the, the, I'm looking at the numbers and every number is alive. Um, and we have, again, 1 million permits approved for Ukrainians, but 40,000 cap for Afghan, uh, Afghani people uh, who worked for the allied forces, not just anyone. And that presses also the question, because Canada's principle is we're bringing the most vulnerable people. But I wonder whether young people who speak English are the most vulnerable among the Afghans. Um, and similarly, we know in Venezuela and in Haiti, we've had crisis for years. Like the Ukraine is in a tragic situation, but one wonders, shouldn't we be looking a little bit more into our backyard in, um, you know, in the Americas? Um, or why uh, are we only worried about Ukrainians and not just the people in Sudan? So how, how do we balance these uh, uh, you know, political and moral considerations? You know, the, the, it's no surprise that foreign policy is at times driven by, uh, by by domestic considerations. It also has to be driven by truth and principle. Uh, and those often get confused uh, and often they give results that look closer to one end of the spectrum than, than the other. I think we can sort of walk and chew gum, but at the same time, um, we've been criticized as Canada as trying to be everything to everyone and being the only one out there uh, sometimes isn't the most efficient way of doing things. Uh, you know, I give, and I'll answer the, the your, your point on, on Ukraine uh, after what the point I make now, but, uh, you know, one of the big concerns that we have with our most important partner to the south of us in the United States is a coordinated approach to the mass migration and mass flow of people coming through the Americas. Um, the pathway you mentioned for Venezuelans and Haitians was very important, not only for Canada, for who we are and who we've, who we've uh, said we will support as part of um, helping ease the pressure in the Darien Gap, uh, ease the pressure at the Mexican border, is that coordinated approach with the US. And the Prime Minister agreed with, with President Biden to take about 15,000 people in a coordinated way so that the US could also leverage that and use that in terms of their more controlled resettlement, as opposed to everyone sort of rolling the dice and putting their lives at risk and crossing in uh, through, the, through the Mexican border, which has been a huge political hotspot and is perhaps even existential to the, um, the political fortune of the current, uh, the current administration. Uh, so yes, it's important to be coordinated. It's important to look in your, uh, in your backyard to make sure we are doing things right and I would put to you that we are doing that, um, but Canada can't do everything. And given the political winds, particularly that are blow blowing in the West, the uncontrolled flow of migration, a lot of countries are turning, a lot of un, you know, countries that you would not expect, like Sweden, for example, are turning their backs to migration. And so Canada uh, stands pretty much alone in its defense of a humanitarian approach to things. I think it's something we can still be proud of. Uh, but it is something that's under pressure. And so when we start comparing different programs, when we start comparing 
um, Ukraine to uh, the programs that we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis Gaza, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Americas. Uh, they do invite comparison. I think they do invite analysis. But I think we also have to look at what our what our who we are as a country, who we can accept, and um, and making sure that we are, are 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 proud of our international efforts. And we mentioned at the outset the political consequences of very important decisions that we took as a government, often during uh, a pol a political election like we had when the Afghanistan crisis broke out. Um, those do have consequences, and they have consequences on a number of things that we wouldn't have necessarily have anticipated at the beginning. You mentioned 32 Afghan from from thousands of people from Afghanistan. It's closer to closer to 50 now, um, and we can talk about vulnerability. But we gave certain principled undertakings to those that served Canadian forces and their families. Sometimes their families of 15 people, uh, and we have to fulfill those promises. And um, vulnerability is also another aspect of this, and it's key that clear that those people are vulnerable because they would be targeted by the Taliban. Um, but are we getting everything right? Um, I could never give you that assurance. Let me let me take you up on that, uh, Minister, because you talked about the uh, politics. This is a democracy forum, so let's engage on the politics of of, of immigration policy. Uh, you've lived in America. You've lived in Sweden. You mentioned both of them just now in in that in those reflections. So in the U.S., everyone in Canada watches American politics, and we see the tumult, the controversy. It is a political hot-button issue. We tend to assume, as you kind of implied, that we're all happy, happy about immigration in Canada, that there is a strong social consensus, partly directed by our political leaders, not all, but most of them. Where are we at now? And, and are you worried? You do your own polling in the ministry. There is public polling. We saw during the Roxham Road uh, era when people would just walk across the border between border crossings that that eroded public trust, no question. That's why your your predecessor tried so hard to fix it with that fifteen thousand trade off and so on. So, rocks and roads over, but there have been immigration and refugee flows in Toronto and housing pressures and all those elements. As a as a minister in a cabinet, where do you see the the trend line for Canada on the the political? sensitivities of immigration and refugee policy? Um, well, look, Martin, I'm not naive. Uh, I think that, you know, I can't deny the winds that are blowing against immigration uh, and the particular sort of hot spots that exemplify that, whether that's Roxham Road, whether it's the news coverage you see, particularly by, by American TV chains, a various description uh, of things going on in, in, in large, no more northern cities. Um, and 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 the ongoing coverage that we've seen for years at the at the U.S. Mexican border, uh, Canada is not immune to that. I, I do think, however, that we do have a consensus that is still there. I think people are still positive towards immigration. The more detailed polls that you see, and the more detailed analysis that you see, is Canadians are increasingly tying that to affordability. They're increasingly tying it. They're increasingly tying it to their frustrations with the inability of various levels of government, including the federal government, to properly coordinate, organize, and make sure that that integration is well done. And when I talk about that, I, I mean matters of federal jurisdiction, border safety, airport safety control, uh, visa issuance. You, you saw the difficult decision I took with respect to Mexico, but also areas that are of provincial jurisdiction, healthcare, housing. Uh, education doesn't mean the federal government can't play a financial role in that and it's even even a, a supportive role in many ways but this is a coordination exercise that we've largely been not as good at as we should have and you know I talked to a lot of business uh, chambers of commerce I talked to individual businesses I talked to I talked to universities and schools they all talk to me about the importance of bringing people in they don't talk to me about their own responsibility and making sure they continue to sell that consensus and so I I say we've gotten a bit lazy as a country in selling that consensus. It is still a very valuable consensus. The further out you get from Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, you see the huge importance still that immigration plays in regions, um, just regions that have been revived because of increased immigration. Uh, but that's not work that we're doing in a coordinated way. There's a huge suck coming from those big commercial centers and, and immigrants will go there to get work, to, to, to be with their communities, to get the supports that they have. And so we have to kind of counteract that, but that needs still there. Whether we like it or not, we still need uh, controlled immigration unless people magically decide to have more children. Uh, and that's the reality of it. I think to our credit though, we've done a really good job in making the labor force younger. That's been noted by the Bank of Canada, um, but that has not come out, come without the conundrum that exists with respect to housing and affordability that we're currently seeing. 
So there's no question there's an elite elite consensus on this. Economists at the banks and so on who look at the statistics understand that. But you've lived abroad, I've lived abroad, and Anna has lived abroad. And there, uh, my own view is that Canadians are not uniquely endowed with a moral compass that others in Australia and America or Sweden or Britain or France don't have. It's just that we have, we enjoy this splendid isolation in Canada where we can cherry pick our way through the, the migration forces that are sweeping the world. So when you think about the next election, which is on the horizon a year from now, perhaps, uh, do you think that the general consensus among the political parties, with some exceptions, is fraying and that this that, that it could turn in Canada, that it could get that set that, that if it's not a consensus, that that kind of equilibrium could become a disequilibrium. I, I do worry about it. Uh, you, you know, I I don't necessarily think I, I, I'm very proud of being a Canadian. I don't think we are necessarily um, more morally superior to a number of countries that have had a number of challenges with 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 immigration. Uh, we are all humans. We have vulnerabilities. We have our views. We have our prejudices. Uh, some unconscious, and we can't, can't can't deny that. Luckily, I think we've avoided the. We saw it early. If you recall, we saw it earlier in uh, in 2016, 2017. Um, it sort of disappeared from the national narrative, uh, but we've generally been good as parties in avoiding a huge xenophobic debate on immigration. We framed it in different uh, in different optics: uh, integration and uh, affordability. I think we sh we should avoid those debates. Not that we shouldn't be discussing these issues in a serious way and in a reasoned way, but I do think that all it takes is some jackass publicly to say something dumb in a in a major political party and make that part of their platform. Um, frustration can be whipped up in many ways. Politicians do have responsibilities, and it it would be terrible to have an election on the backs of uh, some of the most vulnerable people in the world, but also some of the most vulnerable people in in Canada. Um, but I'm not naive to think that it can happen. And we remember the barbaric cultural practices hotline as a proxy. Anna, over to you. I want to say, first of all, we shouldn't under underestimate the, the fact that Canadians are smart. And we've seen in the latest polls also that they know immigration makes this place a better place from a cultural and, and, and religious perspective and from an economic perspective. But of course, yes, they, they, they've been worried about the pace of immigration and about all the, the inflation, the housing shortages, et cetera. But I wanna conclude with a more, uh, should I say technical or policy question. We've seen the US implementing new humanitarian pathways, trying to have people make appointments, you know, through an app while uh, staying in Mexico. And we know that is a challenge for all governments. I wanna do good for um, asylum seekers. How do you make sure it's not the survival of the fittest? It's not who makes it to the Darien Gap and through the Darien Gap. It's not who makes it through Roxham Road. Um, do you have any ideas? Have you consulted in your government about what Canada could do in this uh, way? We know in Europe there's been examples of religious organizations trying to create these humanitarian pathways. Um, we've, we know some other NGOs try to create that. Do you, do you have any plans on this? You know, when I when I speak to UNH, we, we've worked largely through the UN that has a sophisticated network. I think that has been uh, a very productive one. Uh, you just have to look at the numbers of people that we've brought through that network and to demonstrate that it, that it has. Um, I'd say a couple of things. I do worry about some of the experts at UNHCR, our international experts, don't think my concern is as uh, important as it is, but I, I, I do often wonder whether we are getting the most vulnerable. Uh, sometimes Canada being out there means that we do get to cherry pick uh, different types of refuge. Refugees are, 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 can, can have been doctors or lawyers. They can uh, be in good health or bad health. Uh, the equity aspect of that does concern me. I worry about the forgotten war in Sudan that we have uh, a new humanitarian pathway for as well. So it's not that I'm unconcerned about these things. Uh, I do also think there are ways to be more experienced, smart, and and uh, coordinated in our efforts to resettle people globally. That takes other partners other than Canada. And I think that's my, my real worry when I go to these conferences and see countries sort of pulling back. Uh, the discussions that I have had with Secretary Mayorkas in the States about the hubs that they are using in, uh, in, in Mexico or elsewhere are very important. I think what the U.S. had proposed, the U.S. has piggybacked on a number of our initiatives 
um, which is nice. Uh, that, but they're hubs that we are seeing uh, need to be effective. And I think that's the challenge. If we want them to work, we have to be able to see that they work. And then we will, we, we have said to the US, for example, that we will work with them, um, but they need to get up and running and, and going and, and, and consistently demonstrate that they can be sort of a safety valve for people taking their lives into their own hands, risking their lives to get to safety. No, I agree. We don't know that they work. I agree. Martin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 Minister, you talked today about the high number of refugee claimants, uh, refugee claims, asylum claims, I should say, from, from students. But we also know that there is a large number of, of refugee flows that tend to converge on Toronto and the big cities. And in Toronto, though, where we're calling, we're talking from today, there was a real mess in terms of the number, uh, the, the supports that were not sufficient from Ottawa because it's a federal issue, federal jurisdiction. And the mayor on a previous democracy forum, Olivia Chow, complained about the lack of support she was getting federally. And the deputy prime minister, Christopher Freeland, kind of wrote this bureaucratic letter last year, late last year, saying, oh, we're giving you so much money. Really, what are you complaining about? And it took a long time. It took months of political negotiations for the finance minister and you to come together with the mayor and deliver the money that was needed. So question is, why did it take so long? If we know that these refugee flows are overwhelming Toronto's shelters, emergency homeless shelters, why, uh, to the point, to the extent that they were displacing even or crowding out, let's say, uh, folks who are already here and are not in housing, why so long? How did that crisis come about when it could have been, should have been solved between all of you talking together? Yeah, I know. Look, um, hindsight's twenty twenty, Martin. The, the the I mean, the reality is 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 is, is constitutionally re uh, refugee um, responsibility is is split. I, I, it's often politically ascribed to the government of of Canada and with a particular face on it, and I get that. But the the reality is is there is a responsibility. The mayor Chow has acknowledged that she is assumed to house people in a humane humanitarian way. Um, church basements, churches with one, maybe two bathrooms um, is not the best way to, well, or using shelters that are designed for a different segment of the population uh, is not the best way to, uh, to welcome, welcome or to house people, particularly when it's, when it's getting cold. Um, we had in the past and obviously seeing flows through Roxham Road, people then diverting to Toronto, uh, is a reality that's undeniable and that flow is one that has increased over the last uh, year or so rather dramatically or people coming into Pearson or Trudeau airports that then uh, direct themselves towards the city centers. Uh, oddly, the face of what was on a lot of the press conferences is not necessarily the portrait that one would have of, of, uh, of asylum seekers in Canada, um, but it is something I think that sees uh, at, at least the uh, people of Toronto um, and I think it is something that political, politically was fraught, but also required uh, the intervention of the government of Canada. Uh, often that comes through cutting a check or using other resources. And there was lots of discussions as to whether we should properly use armories or other unused space. What we saw, I think, was a failure of coordination. Um, uh, Mayor Chow and the work that we put together, uh, I spoke to her, Sean Fraser spoke to her. Uh, from the get-go. Um, and I think there were some logistical challenges in making sure those people were properly housed. And I think they could be properly housed. There's a, there is a responsibility of the government of Ontario on this. There were in the past welcome centers to be able to deal with those flows. They were shut down. Um, and that's something I think that we need to talk about as we coordinate. It's, it's interesting in the two provinces that have the overwhelming burden uh, of people coming in, Quebec and Ontario, how differently their systems work, despite the sometimes toxic political rhetoric, rhetoric coming out of Quebec. Quebec actually does a good job in housing people, um, as frustrating as some of the uh, as some of the politics are of it. Um, whereas in Ontario, the resources, despite the availability of housing, uh, are driven through different local, more mayoral initiatives. And the province has not been as present as it should have. Uh, and and that's, that's the reality of things. It often comes with money. I don't deny the responsibility of the federal government when there is a large segment of asylum seekers coming in and those numbers to act quickly. I think with what you've seen is significant investments into Toronto, but it takes that willpower, it takes that need to get uh, things, money on the ground, money into pockets 
shelters open and a proper processing of asylum seekers so that they can get the due process that they're entitled to. Uh, that's on us. Um, the mayor properly said they needed work permits quickly. We acted quickly. But again, what I saw there is more of a challenge of coordination and us actually working together than one of lack of wills, uh, for lack of a better expression. Well, as a political journalist, I understand it's always about complexity, but a complexity can be hard to explain. Uh, I do. We're almost out of time. I just want to ask, we, we've we been uh, inspired by the questions we've received from, from people in the audience, but there's one question that I want to just read directly. I don't have a name attached to it, uh, but it was, uh, let me just read it out to you, Minister, before we conclude. And thanks, by the way, for going into overtime for a few moments. Uh, would you kindly comment on the increased anti-immigration sentiment bordering on racism that is now more evident in the Kitchener-Waterloo area because of the high international student population, specifically from India? Can't really blame people for feeling that way. There's no housing and no jobs, but it seems people are lashing out against uh, or voicing their dissent against a group of people instead of the government. Uh, it's not very reassuring feeling as a brown person to know that in times of crisis, the immediate reaction is more ethnocentric in nature. Tough question, but any thoughts on that? Well, look, in tough times, the first person people to, to, to pay for hardship are, have often been the most vulnerable, and that includes um, people that are less wealthy or racialized folks. Um, that's just reality that's consistent throughout time. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, we've seen in the Kitchener-Waterloo area a significant increase in international students. Um, and again, I don't want to fault them for wanting a better life, wanting to get a job, wanting to get a great education, perhaps go to their country and, and make that country better or uh, get a permanent residency path in Canada, but it has to be done in a way that um, uh, that is regulated reason and reasonable. And I think there have been large increases in the population there with with a corresponding large increase in, in the cost of living. It's unfortunate that people um, then turn their their gaze on to people that don't look like them. Um, but that is often, sadly, the reality of human nature and, and, and Canadians aren't, aren't immune to that at all. Uh, I, I think that we can do better um, and I think we will do better once we have a system when it comes to international students that is something that uh, that is more controlled and I think where the institutions themselves have more responsibility in making sure that those people are properly integrated into their um, their surrounding neighborhoods. Um, a lot of the times international students are a, are a financial boon for um, particularly more rural areas and I think that's one of the challenges that we have to make in, in the adjustments but I, I really it's unfortunate that it's turned to, to, to xenophobia at times, and a lot of these reports are anecdotal, but I, I certainly don't discount them. So we're almost out of time, and, and, I, and I want to just I ask, have... sneak in one last question um, that I think is on the minds of a lot of people here. Uh, people have asked me about, in fact, you spent your first years in cabinet uh, as minister responsible for Indigenous issues. And I think I want to know, and a lot of people want to know, what, what was your takeaway after, before you dived into solving all the world's problems? You were facing our own homegrown problems uh, and challenges. So what? So were you overwhelmed by when you took on the challenge of indigenous of reconcil reconciliation with indigenous peoples? And, and in particular, were you daunted by the, the, the expectation of action, not just reconciliation? What do we need to know? Uh, what did you learn? Uh, what do we need to know as the children of immigrants? Well, I, I quickly re always reminded that I myself was an immigrant. Um, I, I, I once sat in a room where it was pointed out to me that I was the only uh, technical immigrant in the room. It was full of Indigenous peoples. Uh, it kind of both got a lot of laughter since my family's been here for generations. But that's the reality of Canada. We're a country of immigrants. I don't think there's anyone that uh, is credible that could tell you that they were prepared for uh, a position in, 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 in Indigenous affairs, no matter what the description. It is, um, it is a very heavy job. It is very consequential to the future of the country, particularly when you're in a government that's... Um, that's as ambitious as ours. I walked into it a couple months before uh, the outbreak of uh, a global pandemic with um, communities shutting down, with airlines shutting down, um, at times having to deploy the army into communities, trying to make sure that people were just safe. Um, I was asked to reflect on it yesterday in a classroom of, um, of people that were 16, 17, asking me what the biggest challenge was. And uh, I didn't say money. I didn't say resources. Uh, I, I told them the truth and said it was trust. So building trust, I think, is, is integral to anything we do in the government. Um, and that carries over into the job that I have today. We have to be and show Canadians that we are trustworthy, that we are reasonable in the measures we take, uh, despite our political ambitions, ambitions, which in case of this government have, have, have been quite large. And so that's been my takeaway from it. it they've all they've both been 
and our enriching experiences that are very hard to re reproduce in private life. So I, I don't regret them at all. Um, but sometimes I am the grumpy guy. So um, <laughs> what it's worth. Okay, we're out of time for questions. So I'm now going to turn it over to our colleague at TMU, uh, Jishi Chuang, who is the academic center uh, of the Center for Immigration and Settlement at TMU. Uh, but before I do, I'm going to sneak in my own thanks to you, Minister, for informally for, for joining the Democracy Forum and to my co-host, uh, today, the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration, I love that title, at TMU, Professor Anna Tranda Fididou. J'espère que la prochaine fois nous serons face à face. But you know, it's a snow day in Toronto, so it's just as well. Uh, the, the city shuts down, as you know, when, when there's a bit of snow on the ground. So à la prochaine. Merci tout le monde. Megwitch, uh, many thanks, safe travels, and uh, Jishi, over to you. Thank you, Martin. As we draw this session to a close, I wish to extend our deepest gratitude to Minister Mueller for sharing such incredible and invaluable insights with us today. Your candor and dedication are greatly appreciated as we come together to discuss complex migration issues and seek viable solutions. I'd also like to express my heartfelt thanks to our co-hosts, Anna and Martin, for moderating today's discussions. Your efforts have been pivotal in facilitating meaningful dialogue a special note of appreciation goes to the DAS for sponsoring the Democracy Forum. Your support and sponsorship have made today's event possible. Lastly, I want to acknowledge the significant impact this event has on our students and faculty at Toronto Metropolitan University. Many of us are deeply engaged in the study of immigration and settlement. Today's discussions not only enrich our academic pursuits, but also underscore the critical importance of migration issues to the fabric of our city, our country, and our communities. We are committed to working together for a better future in Canada. Thank you all for your invaluable contributions and for being a part of this timely and important conversation. We are now closing this event. Thank you everyone and take good care.